Oh, good day, friends. Today we have the last in our series titled, Why is God so serious about? Today it's the Bible. My name is Peter de Villiers and I'm with Villiersdorp Community Church, which is in the little village of Villiersdorp in South Africa. I'm going to read from the Bible. I'll be reading from Psalm 19. But before I read, let me pray. Father God, we come to your word to learn about your word, the Bible. And we pray that, that you would give us teachable hearts and minds. And we pray that we would stand in awe before you as we look at your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins, that they um, may they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, the Bible is God's word. You know, this is a statement that is being challenged from all sides. It seems as if the truth and reliability and authority and authenticity and relevance of the Bible is being challenged more and more vigorously as time goes on. In the public arena, people that reject the Bible and God are increasingly seen as heroes. And those that still hold on to a belief in God and in the Bible, they are seen as foolish. A South African example is a man by the name of Dave Pepler. Now, Dave Pepler is, is also internationally a well-regarded zoologist and environmentalist. And he was also for the, the Afrikaans radio station Aris Gheer, he was also their in-house zoologist and environmentalist, and he's an atheist. I remember driving from church one Sunday and switching the radio on to, of, to Aris Gheer, and Dave Pepler was busy answering questions from listeners. Someone had written in with this question. Can't you somehow find it in yourself to at least acknowledge the possibility of the existence of a creator God? And he answered something like this. He said, the reason some people believe in the existence of a creator God has to do with how our brains function. And then he said, it works like this. When we are confronted with something that we don't understand, our brains come up with a story to satisfy our uncertainty. Of course, in this answer, he was implying that, that people who believe in God are too stupid to understand science. So their brains have come up with the story of a creator God. Now, there is, is this perceived war between science and religion. And this war has been driven by some scientists. And of course, the best example is Richard Dawkins with his book, The God Delusion. 
And in the book, he tries to make the point that as more and more people embrace science, more and more people will reject God. He, he presents God and science as mutually exclusive. Yet, the truth is that science came from Christianity. Christians that, that were amazed at God's creation desired to learn more about it. An example is Johannes Kepler, the 16th century astronomer. He said, the chief aim of all the investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God. And then another angle from which the Bible is discredited is from the angle of miracles. I mean, the question that is asked is, but how can you believe that someone who died came back to life three days later? But have you ever wondered about this? I mean, we don't see people rising from death today. Why should we believe it happened then? I and mean, then we're not even asking about all the other miracles in the Bible. And of course, those that reject the notion of miracles do so because they already believe something else, namely that miracles are impossible. And they believe that miracles are impossible because they don't believe in God. But you know, we can respond to all these arguments with many valid answers. There's archaeology. There, there are extra biblical writings that, that prove the historicity of events recorded in the Bible. We can literally dump tons of documents that, that prove the reliability and authenticity of the Bible. But even though these arguments and proofs may be helpful, none of them will convince an unbeliever to trust in Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. We read in James 2 verse 19, You believe that there is one God? Good! Even the demons believe that! And shudder! I believe the same is true of the Bible. Satan knows that the Bible is the truth, but he hates the truth of the Bible. You know, it is, it's one thing to argue for the historicity of the Bible, but when it comes to the essence of the Christian faith, when it comes to the claims of, of Jesus that he is the Son of God, and the Bible declaring all human beings to be sinners, and when it comes to believing that Jesus' death atones for our sin and that he rose from death, and when it comes to the, the ample warnings in the Bible of, of a judgment day that is coming, a day on which some will be saved and others not, and when it comes to the, the moral and ethical issues of our day, things like transgenderism and abortion and civil governance and the importance of the church, then, then we have to see that what we as Christians believe hinges not only on the historical authenticity of the Bible, but on whether the claims made by God about himself and the claims made by Jesus Christ about himself are true. So how can we know that the Bible is true? Especially when it comes to the declarations on, on who we are and who God is and who Jesus Christ is. Well, the short answer is, you discover the truth of the Bible. You see, when you really read the Bible, it has a way of communicating that is real and that can also be terrifying. When you read the Bible honestly and seriously, the, the, you discover the truth of Hebrews 4 verse 12, which says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And because the word of God is alive and active, and because it truly judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, atheists do all that they can to discredit God's word. And they try to use science to do this. 
Uh, John Lennox, a renowned mathematician, philosopher, bioethicist, and Christian apologist. He said, science, marvelous as it is, is limited. Even a Nobel Prize winner, by analyzing a cake, cannot tell why it was made. But, but Aunt Matilda, who made it, can tell you. She can reveal it to you. But if she doesn't reveal it to you, you'll never know. And then John Lennox adds to this, it's the same with the universe. We can analyze it magnificently, but ultimately, if it has a maker, and I believe it has, only he can tell us what it's all about. And he has done so with the powerful narrative of the Bible. Now we see something of how this works in Psalm 19. In the first six verses, David proclaims the, the wonder of creation. So he writes about the, the heavens and the skies at night. He was probably standing outside, maybe looking at the stars. And, and then he also writes about the sun that rises at one end of the heavens and sets at the other end, giving warmth to everything. But we can also see the wonder of creation in science. I mean, science does research and explains to us the wonder of how it all works. But David goes further than science. You see, David puts creation into perspective. Creation, the stars, the sun, none of these are there for their own sake. We read in verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So David is telling us that, that creation stands in the service of its creator. Creation proclaims the glory of God. You see, the creator is known by his works. Paul in Romans 1 says that, that God's glory is so evident in creation that in looking at creation, you have to see God's glory have no excuse. Romans 1 verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. But then going on in Psalm 19, there's a change in the psalm. Call this point the wonder of God's word. You see, after seeing God's glory in creation, suddenly in verses 7 to 11, David jumps to God's word. It, it seems as if seeing God in creation, seeing God's hand, drives David to God's word. Now, the structure of these verses um, is noteworthy. David mentions characteristics of God's word. And then he links the characteristics to the outworking or effect of these characteristics. I've, I've marked these outworkings um, in red. Let me go through them from, from verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. And by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. You see, science can tell us how the planets revolve around one another and how it is true that, that the sun is exactly the right distance from the earth so that it doesn't fry us. But God's word tells us why creation was so magnificently made by God. And the human sciences can go a long way in helping us deal with broken relationships between people. But science 
cannot explain or deal with the fundamental reason for the behavioral breakdown of the human race. See, the Bible goes to the depth of the problem, namely the broken relationship between people and God. And the Bible deals with this by teaching how this relationship with God can be restored through the salvation he brought through Jesus Christ. Of course, the first promise of this salvation we find right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 3, the promise of the snake crusher. And from there the whole story develops. God makes promise after promise of salvation. And to get everything in place, he chooses a people to be his own. And from them, he promises that the Savior will come, um, a Savior of the whole of the, of the human race, those that believe in him, and that it will come from the family of David. And then the scandal. I mean, in that day anyway, the Savior, the Son of God is born from David's line. And this line includes women, amongst whom is a prostitute, and, and to top it all, even a Moabite woman. You see, it is in Jesus Christ and in this genealogy that we see the nature of God. Not only did he teach the golden rule, he lived it. He fed the hungry, he healed the sick, he, he sought out society's outcasts. He brought respect and dignity to the marginalized. And he, he brought forgiveness and peace and joy to millions around the world. And he is able to do this because even though he was born as a man, he is God. And the central point on which the truth of the Bible stands or falls, and the central point on which our faith stands or falls, is the historical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, death is not the end, and atheism is false. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, Christianity is false. But as you honestly and seriously dig into the Bible, as you allow the Bible to speak to you, you will discover its truth. This is how most people in the world have come to believe that the Bible is God's word, not because they analyzed stacks of historical data, but simply because they read the Bible and recognized that God was speaking there. As you study God's word, you will find God speaking to you. You see, God is not an idea. God is a person. He's a personal God. And he gave us his word so that we can get to know him. And as you get to know him, you won't simply believe that there is a God. You get to know him intimately and, and trust him personally. Getting to know God also confronts us with ourselves as sinners. And we see this in, in Psalm 19. See, after be con being confronted with God's word, David realizes how sinful he is. So he prays and he goes to God asking for forgiveness and also with a desire to live to God's glory. Verses 12 to 14, we see this. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me, then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Trusting in God gives a sense of unmerited forgiveness and acceptance and, and peace. And we can trust him because he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for our sin. And Jesus rose from death, thereby conquering death, which, which causes me to live with a certain knowledge of an eternal future with God. Let me come to a conclusion. So yes, Many scientists reject the notion of the existence of God and of the truth of the Bible. But why then are there, are there so many world-renowned Christian scientists? I mean, even at a secular university like 
MIT. And there are so many stories of scientists who honestly and seriously read the Bible and became Christians. For example, Professor Rosalind Picard. She viewed people that believed in God as uneducated. Until one day when a very educated doctor challenged her to read the Bible. So she thought that it might be a good idea to read the best-selling book of all time. She read the whole Bible. And she read it again. Now to make a long story short, let me quote her. I once thought I was too smart to believe in God. Now I know I was an arrogant fool who snubbed the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of all science, mathematics, art and everything else there is to know. Today I walk humbly, having received the most undeserved grace. I walk with joy, alongside the most amazing companion anyone could ask for, filled with desire to keep learning and exploring. You know, to be healthy Christians, nothing is more important than maintaining a deep trust in the truth of God's word. And this will only happen if we continually keep on learning and exploring God's word. Listening to someone like me preaching from God's word once a week is only a help. It's not enough. So, so that is the challenge for us today. Read God's word. And if this is something you struggle with, as many people do, there are tools to help us. For example, there's an organization called The Word One to One. And the idea is that you regularly meet with someone to read with you from the Bible. And as a further help, there's even an app. Starting with the Gospel of John, the app helps you to read through the Gospel with some helpful notes to guide you. I'll put a link to this in the description below. It's my prayer that 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 will be your experience as you continue learning and exploring God's Word. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, may his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Let me pray. Father God, oh, that we may see your glory as we read your word, that we may know you as our Father, that we may know the joy of the salvation you give through your Son, Jesus Christ that we may treasure the truth of your word because it is truly your word. Help us in this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for allowing me into your home again. It's my prayer that God's word will, will be your anchor and that it will sustain you in your faith as we live in a world that rejects God's word. As a song for today, I have the song there is one gospel by City of Light. There's a link to it in the description below and there's an on-screen link next to me. So until next time, God bless and goodbye.